morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth day of the Drones Conference. And it's my pleasure to present uh, the first speaker, Paul Wedrich from University of Hamburg. He will talk about uh, on skin theory in dimension four. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. Um, it's a sad occasion that brings us together, but I think it's also a wonderful opportunity to celebrate the extraordinary life and mathematical achievements of Vaughan Jones. And, um, I feel very honored to make a contribution to this. So um, I have a slightly ambitious plan for this talk. It's about a topic that I feel very, that I'm very excited about. So I want to tell you about the content of three papers. Um, let's see how that goes. So the talk has four parts. Um, in the first part, I guarantee that there's nothing new, but it sets the stage for what comes later. Uh, the second part is on a Kirby color for Kavana homology, which is joint work in progress with Matt Hogenkamp and Dave Rose. And then in the third part, I will put this in the context of scale modules for four manifolds that we defined in a paper with Scott Morrison and Kevin Walker about three years ago. And then at the end, I will talk about ways of computing these scale modules um, that we've developed in a paper with Cipri Manulescu and Kevin Walker, which appeared on the archive a few weeks ago. So that's kind of the plan. So let me start right in. So we, I think we all know the skein relation. Um, this is the skein relation, basically the only skein relation that we, that we have in the temporary leap category and temporary leap algebra. So the circle evaluates to some scalar and here the scalar is Q plus Q inverse. Okay, um, from this we build this temporary leap category. I guess we all know and love this. Um, we consider the span of one-dimensional submanifolds properly embedded in the square. Um, we take this to be linear over the ring of Laurent polynomials in Q, and there are some rules that these things have to satisfy. So the strings in this square have to be vertical near the boundary. I don't want to have boundary on the left or on the right. And then I consider this span up to ambient isotopy relative to the boundary and the skein relation from the previous slide that you can replace a little circle by this factor of Q plus Q inverse. Yeah, so no surprise here. This gives a monoidal category, temporary leap, temporary leap Jones category. And this has two ways of composing. It has the categorical composition of morphisms, which in this picture way is encoded by stacking these squares on top of each other. Um, to be able to do this, we of course need the top boundary points of one thing matching the bottom boundary points of the other thing, and we can stack them together. And the other operation is this monoidal structure, this tensor product, which is just realized by putting these squares side by side. Okay, why am I talking about this? Because there's maybe a slightly less well-known version one dimension up, and those are the skin relations. So these are, I call them the barnard hahn kavan of skin relations. And now they're not relations where, that allow you to replace a circle by a scalar, but here we are somehow, instead of strings, we have surfaces. The surfaces come with decorations that I'll call dots. So they're marked surfaces. And, and these are somehow the most, this is the most common set of relations. You can replace a sphere by zero, by a factor of zero, a dotted sphere by one, there's a way of cutting an annulus into the sum of caps, but one of the caps has to have a dot. And if you have two or more dots on a piece of surface, you get zero. Now we can, using these skein relations, we can do something very similar to building the temporary leap category. And for this, we consider, the, say, the span over the rationals of dotted two-dimensional cobordisms properly embedded, this time not in a square, but in a cube. And there are similar rules that this thing has to satisfy. Maybe the surface has to be vertical near the boundary. There's no boundary on the left and on the right of this cube. Um, then we quotient out by ambient isotopy relative to the boundary, and we impose the skein relations that I had on the previous slide. And now you might ask, okay, so this looks a bit like, like temporally leave one dimension up, but where did the Q go? And it turns out the Q, um, so the, the, the variable Q is no longer in the ground ring, but it turns into a grading. The grading is uh, somehow grayed out here. You can compute the grading of such a, such a morphism by counting the number of dots, subtracting the Euler characteristic of the underlying surface, and then having some correction factor which depends on the number of vertical boundary segments in the on the front and on the back of this cube. So this forms a category that I want to call the Barnatan category. It depends on the number of these vertical boundary segments in front and in the back. And we have a categorical composition which just corresponds to stacking cubes. But of course, this is not everything you can do in this setting. You can also put these cubes side by side and behind each other. And this turns 
this um, collection of Banatan categories for various numbers of, of boundary segments into a monoidal bicategory. So if you've never seen monoidal bicategories before, that's an example of it. It's something that where the compositions are modeled on, on the operations that you can do with cubes. You can stack them, you can put them side by side, and you can put them behind each other. So summary, this Banatan um, um, thing is a locally graded, locally Q-linear monoidal bicategory. So the, the things that fill the cubes are uh, vector spaces over the rationals and uh, actually graded vector spaces over the rational and all the composition operations respect these structures. This gives a categorification of the temporary leap category in the following sense. So there's a canonical isomorphism of, mon of monoidal categories which are linear over this ring of Laurent polynomials from the temporary leap category into the growth and decomonoidal category of the monoidal bicategory that you get by taking the graded additive completion of this Bonatan thing. Those are many words. Um, I don't want to say much more about this. I just want basically to bring a pro uh, across this point that there's this very natural categorification of the temporary leap category. And this is what, what's underlying um, the construction of Komano homology and its versions for tangles. Okay, so this is some kind of skein theory one dimension up from Tempeli Leap, and now you might ask, can I do this for different manifolds and so on? What is special about the cubes that I had on the previous slide? Well, there's nothing special about these cubes. If you give me a compact oriented surface with a finite set of points in the boundary, what I can do is I can consider one manifold embedded in the surface with prescribed boundary S, and then I consider the linear combinations of these Banatan dotted cobordisms in thickened surface and organize them into a category. Let's call this Bn f comma s. And then because this is a skein theoretic construction, there are natural gluing operations between them, which are very fine. So can be formalized in different ways. But so this has been studied for a long time. Uh, Burner in 2008, around 2008, and Heather Russell also around 2008 studied Banatan skein modules for the solid torus and also for thickened surfaces. There's a construction um, of the Aseida, Pshtitsky, Shikora surface link homologies using, using this picture and so on. What will play an important role in this talk is a special case of this construction, namely when I take the surface to be the annulus and I take the empty set of boundary points. So this we call the annular Banatan category uh, this is when you draw one manifold in your surface, and you, uh, in your surface when this is the annulus, it's just a ring as one times the interval without boundary points. Okay, and now um, I can come to um, uh, maybe non-standard definition of the dotted temporary leap category. The uh, dotted temporary leap category we want to define as the full subcategory of this annular Barnatan category, which is, um, which contains as objects exactly the rotationally symmetric objects um, in, 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 the, in the annulus. So here below you see some pictures. So I draw these Banatan dotted cobordisms in an annulus and I want them to be rotationally symmetric except for the placement of dots. And then there's a proposition which has a long history um, and it also works in, in greater generality that the morphism spaces between rotationally symmetric objects may also be considered as rotationally symmetric. And the inclusion of this subcategory, this full subcategory yields an equivalence of categories upon proceeding to graded additive completions. So in some sense, all the information about this annular Barnatan category is captured by its rotationally symmetric part. And if I have everything described in a rotationally symmetric fashion, I can reduce the dimension of this calculus by just quotienting by the S1 action. And this is, this is what's happening here. So for example, and uh, one particular rotationally symmetric object is just a circle which is concentric to the annulus. Um, and an endomorphism of this is just a cylinder on this. Now I quotient by the S1 action, I just get a strand. The cylinder may also, have, may also carry a dot, and then I remember this by putting a dot on the strand. Other rotationally symmetric morphisms here are these things that, I don't know, you could call cake pans and roof gutters. Um, so, so here um, you have an annulus which is capping off two concentric circles. 
or creating two concentric circles. And if we quotient by the S1 action, we get, we get caps and cups. And so if you believe all of this, you get a, um, you get a description of the distorted temple leap category um, as the name suggests, and oops, oh no, no, no. In terms of, um, well, temporally leap diagrams with dots placed on them. And now if, you, if, if, if I've already lost you, this is a good place to start back in because I can now redefine this dotted temporally leap category simply by telling you these relations. So it's a category where the objects are natural numbers and the morphisms are dotted temporally leap diagrams between I don't know, M boundary points at the bottom and boundary points at the top. We put the relation that a circle evaluates to two. We put the relation that a dot squares to zero and then there's one additional linear relation on, um, on diagrams um, with four endpoints that, have, uh, that carry a single dot. So these four things are linearly dependent in this fashion. So you can take this as a presentation if you want. Chances are that you've seen this before. Um, there are many, many different places where this appears. I'm pretty sure I don't know all of them, um, but here, here are a few examples. So um, we can typically, if you can think of the temporally leap category as describing a part of the representation theory of the quantum group associated to SL2, we can specialize this quantum parameter to one or to minus one. Um, and then we can interpret, uh, for example, the single strand as the identity on the vector representation of SL2, of UQSL2, or of USL2, depending on which setting you're in. And now, the dotted, this dotted temporally leap category has a, very, has a very similar interpretation, so we can, we can assign the same vector spaces here. And then we have to ask ourselves, what does this dot mean? And it turns out that dot is just the Chevrolet generator of SL2, it's E, it's the thing that, that increases the weight. And actually, this, um, this fiber functor from dotted temporally leap to graded vector spaces, yeah, sends this one boundary point to V, the grading comes just from the weight grading, and the dot is E, it increases the weight by two. So it's a, it's a very basic thing, and you probably have seen it before. Um, maybe, maybe the first time I've, I've seen this was in a paper by, by Heather Russell. So she studies the, um, the Barnatan skin module of the solid torus, and she, she, she somehow finds these relations for the dotted temporally leap category, and, and she matches this up with the centers or co-centers of Kavanov's arc rings, which were already matched up with the homology of, of certain Springer varieties. So that's one place where you can also find the story. Um, and then more recently, they've also been found as um, certain endomorphism algebras of um, diagrammatic circle biomodules in affine type A1 and a singular weight KLR truncations in a, in a 2020 paper. So, so they appear in many places. If you have more instances where you've seen this before, please let me know, I'm, I'm interested. There are also some generalizations. So we could, for example, um, not insist that the dot is nilpotent of order two, but impose some other polynomial relation of degree two on the dot, and then we get some equivariant versions, which are also very important in link homology theory. And if we do this, we can recover some instances of the blob algebras of Martin and Soler, and, um, and also, certain cases of type B and D temporally leap algebra studied by Green at the end of the 90s. And, and then a few weeks ago, I also came across another generalization somehow to an odd case. Um, yeah, so you can find this on the archive. Okay, I want to just get a bit familiar with, with basic properties of this, temp, of this dotted temporally leap category because um, um, it, it actually behaves very nicely. So I showed you this relation on four-ended diagrams if you have a single dot. If you actually have two dots, there's an even easier relation. So two parallel strands with dot, one dot each can be reconnected. Second relation, as in the temporally leap category, we have a symmetric group action on objects. So we can interpret a crossing as a linear combination of these two diagrams, and these form, um, so I don't know, they, they behave like, like a symmetric group. This does not quite uh, give us a symmetric monoidal structure on this category because in this presentation here, dots slide through crossings but only up to a sign. That's something we could really normalize away but I don't wanna do this. So let's just embrace the fact that dots slide up to, dots slide up to a sign. 
And then we can also observe that this dotted temporary leap category has morphism spaces which are non-negatively graded. In degree zero, we see the old temporary leap diagrams, and then in higher degrees, we see the things with dots. Okay, and that means in degree zero, in particular, we have jones wenzel projectors. And because we're in the setting where the circle value is two and the braiding, if it exists, is symmetric, this jones wenzel projector can be simply described as um, the Young symmetrizer and the group algebra of the symmetric group pushed into the temporary leap, ca temporary leap category using the, the crossing formula that I had on the previous slide. And now these jones wenzel be projectors behave like we're used to, um, but they have interesting relations to dotted cups and camps. For example, these projectors do not get killed by dotted cups and camps. Indeed, if I have a jones wenzel projector on an even number of strands and I a cap, a cup it off at the bottom with dotted cups, then these dotted cups will, will eat the jones wenzel projector. Another property that you can deduce from this four-term relation is that if you put a dotted cup at the bottom of a projector, it does not matter where you put it. It actually slides along. Okay. There's been some, some basic observations here. And now we can, we can understand this dotted temporal leap category completely, at least as an additive category. It's actually more convenient to describe the Kurubi completion of this, where we somehow adjoin, um, um, adjoin all idempotents. And then this can be described um, basically through the path algebra of a certain quiver. And okay, so what do I have here? I show you the quiver. The, the nodes of the quiver are the jones wenzel projectors. And, and then the, the edges between them tell you the, the morphisms, and then I put some relations on to tell you how these, how these morphisms compose. Okay, so we have between every jones wenzel projector and the one with two more strands, we have a dotted cup morphism that takes us up. If we have at least two strands, we have a dotted cap morphism that takes us down. And then once we have at least one strand, we also have an endomorphism that I call Z, and Z is the alternating uh, sum of dot placements on vertical strands. Um, and these satisfy some very simple relations. So Z is central, it commutes with itself, of course, and it commutes with U and D. Um, it is nilpotent on a jones wenzel of an order that depends on the number of strands. If you have N strands to work with and you want to place N plus one dots, you get zero in any case. So the n plus first power of z is zero if we're in degree n. And then we still have to say what happens if you go up and then down or down and then up. And in both cases, you get minus z squared. Really easy, okay? Okay, so that sets the stage for, um, for the second part. So what's this Kirby color? The Kirby color so there, there's a family of Kirby colors. We start with a non-negative integer k, and we define the Kirby color of winding number k to be a certain directed system over the Kirby completion of this dotted temporal leap category. And for the k version, we start with the kth jones wenzel projector, and then we go up by the dotted cup, and then we go up by the dotted cup ad infinitum. Okay, so this is, this is a directed system of jones wenzel projectors. And you can think about this thing as somehow the jones wenzel projector on an infinite number of strands. That's not a well-defined concept, but this tells you how to approximate it. And that's somehow the appropriate replacement. We consider this directed system as an object of the int completion, of the Kurobi completion, of the dotted temporal elite category, which is somehow a way of um, freely adding filtered colimits, or if you want, directed systems to a category. Okay, and then there's, there's an easy observation that can be made right after this definition, which is that if you compare the Kirby color for K, finding number K and K plus two, they happen to be isomorphic because the directed system that defines omega K plus two is a subsystem, it's a co-final subsystem of this, and then in the incompletion, it turns out that they're isomorphic. So in some sense, there only exist two of these Kirby colors in this setting, and you have this two periodicity. It only depends on the parity of K. And then we can extend from non-negative integers actually to all integers, but because it will only depend on the parity. Okay, so this satisfies a handle slide property. That's why we call it the Kirby color. 
And to explain this, we have to translate back from the dotted temple elite setting to the annular Barnatan setting. So now I draw one manifold in, in the annulus and I draw cobordisms in the thickened annulus. Here we actually use a slightly more complicated setting. We have an annulus which has two boundary points, here and here. And so we not only have concentric stuff, but we also have to match up the boundary points with some string. And there are somehow two basic objects that we have here. It's somehow the left bypass. We can go left around the puncture. And the right bypass, we can go right around the puncture. And in fact, this is a, so the annular Barnatan category is monoidal under just putting annula inside each other. And this annular Barnatan category with two boundary points you can think of as a, as a, as a module category for this monoidal category. Okay, and what does this handle slide lemma say? Well, if we're in this, I don't know, suitable int completion of Karubi completion of this annular Barnatan category with two boundary points, we get an isomorphism of the left object in the presence of a Kirby color and the right object in the presence of a Kirby color. The only subtlety here is that we have to change the winding number on the Kirby color by one if we push a strand of thickness one across, okay? All right, so this is actually not so hard to prove. It's more a challenge in finding suitable language to write down the proof. And, and, and so I already mentioned that we can think of the annular Bonatang category as a monoidal category. Dr. Temple Lieb is a monoidal category. And now this thing, where this thing lives is a, mod, is a, is a module category for Dr. Temple Lieb. So we want to find a suitable diagrammatic description of this. And so what we do is we define a module category for DTL where we have two additional objects, the left bypass and the right bypass. They now have blue strings. Um, the blue string can carry a dot, which means we put a dot on the vertical curtain over the left bypass, do the same thing for the right bypass. And then there's one interesting thing you can do if you have somehow a left curtain, you can drag it around the puncture, saddle it on the other side. And what you'll get is you start from the left bypass, you go to the right bypass, but you've created a consent, you can created a circle around the puncture, okay? And in, in this um, dimensionally reduced notation, we just say we go from the left object to the right object, but in the process, a black strand splits off, and that's what this, that's somehow the, at the end point of this black strand, we see that should, you should think about this as this one circle around the puncture. All right, how do we prove the handle slide lemma? We want to construct a map from left bypass times Kirby to right bypass times Kirby. Both of them are directed systems, so I draw them in similar like chain complexes here horizontally. And then I want to find a map between directed systems between them. Then I found, find, want to find an inverse and check that they're actually inverse. Okay, so the simplest possible maps between directed systems are the ones that look like chain maps. So we're looking for something that that goes vertically up. And I've already drawn the transition maps in this directed system here. There are these dotted cups. Okay, the most naive thing that I can do is I can split off a strand from the left object that converts it into a right object, and I feed the strand into the jones wenzel Okay, that's something. And then it's an easy diagrammatic exercise to check that this square commutes. So this is a map of directed systems, easy. Now, what we want to do is we want to, there's also a version that takes us from right back to left, and we want to compose them. So we want to go from left tensor Kirby to right tensor Kirby to left tensor Kirby back, and it's not quite back. We actually go to the K plus two version instead of the K version, but we already know that the K plus two version is isomorphic to the K version. Good, okay. Um, now, to check that this is an isomorphism, we just compose the components that gives us such a picture. Then we use the familiar property of jones wenzel projectors that big projectors eat small projectors. So we slide the n plus one version in. And then we use one relation that I haven't shown you yet, but I'll do in a second. It's this relation. If we, if we do the curtain dragging twice, there's a way of undoing the interaction of this black stuff with the blue stuff. We just have to place dots either on one side or the other. That will be familiar to many. This is just a neck cutting relation in slightly different language. So we use this relation, apply it, in, apply it here, then what do we get? We get a dot on the left object and the cup hitting a jones wenzel and no dot on this side but a dotted cup hitting this jones wenzel Now we use that jones wenzels kill cups, so this term goes, 
And here we have a dotted cup, and we might as well move it to the right-hand side because dotted cups slide along these projectors, okay? And now, this is the transition map in the directed system, so it's a component of this isomorphism from, from Kirby K to Kirby K plus one, and that's it. Now we've shown that these maps are somehow mutually inverse in one direction, and if we repeat it the other way around, which is completely analogous, you get it the other way. So that's the handle slide property. Proof in, I don't know, three, four minutes. Easy. Now, in categorification, we're not happy with just having some isomorphism here. We actually want to understand how natural this is, and indeed, this is quite natural. And then, again, it's more, more kind of a, a language question to express um, in which sense this is natural, and I find this particularly appealing. So, consider the Barnard-Tank categories over a punctured square. Okay, so this is not nebulous anymore. This is a square. There's a puncture which is drawn as a pole here, and, um, and we allow boundary points at the front and at the back. So I indicated M and N here. Now, just from the typical gluing constructions in skein theory, we can see that this is a bimodule. If we take all of these M and N together, this is a bimodule for this monoidal bi category modeled on what happens inside cubes without poles. If I, if I glue two cubes without poles onto a cube with a pole, I get back a cube with a pole. So that's, that's the bimodule structure. And simultaneously, this thing has an action of the annular Barnatan category without boundary points because you can insert stuff that lives over the annulus next to the puncture. And then the naturality of the handle slide is captured in the following way. We can say, take the object given by the Kirby object with winding zero and with winding one, sum them, they live over the annulus. But using this module structure, we can move it into this punctured uh, square, and then this constitutes, together with the handle slide maps, an object of the Drinful center of the bimodule over this Banatan cube category that is given by the incompletion of the Kirby completion of this PBN thing. Okay, so it's, an, it's, a, it's a higher categorical version of an object of a Drinfold center. Yeah? So that just says, in the presence of a Kirby object around the puncture, you can identify acting on the left with anything in the cube with acting on the right with stuff in that cube. Okay, so, so, so let's leave the higher categorical stuff aside by now and just do some computations. So I mentioned to you this fiber functor from dotted temple leap to graded vector spaces. Now we can hit, um, we can hit the Kirby color with this because graded vector spaces are Kirby complete and, um, and, and have filtered co-limits. So um, if we evaluate uh, this Kirby color under on the fiber functor, we get a graded vector space and I can compute its graded dimension. And what it's gonna be, so it's gonna be something like, and this is where grading shifts come in that I haven't talked really about, it's somehow union of um, irreducible representations of SL2 of increasing dimension shifted down so that the highest weight is in degree zero. And well, what you get as graded dimension is somehow a geometric series in, in Q to the minus two. And as a vector space, what you get is somehow the SL2 Verma module of highest weight zero where we've forgotten the action of the Chevrolet generator F, but we still have E. Okay, so in some sense, Kirby is Verma. Side note, um, once you have somehow this Kirby object in the incompletion, you can ask whether there's a diagrammatic calculus that combines this with the dotted temporary leap story, and there is. But it's a bit exotic, so um, what, you, what you need to do when you want to work with this is you want to, have a, you want to work with a diagrammatic calculus which um, allows infinite sum of diagrams. Okay, and that one has to be really careful when doing this. The reason for this is that if you tensor two Verma modules, you get a direct sum of Verma modules, but they have, there's an infinite multiplicity space, like, um, infinite dimensional multiplicity space. So in the diagrammatic calculus, you want to put, you want to have a relation that tells you that the identity on the tensor product splits into an infinite direct sum, uh, so an infinite sum of orthogonal idempotents. So I need some diagrammatic calculus which, which allows infinite sums. And we have something like this. Here's an example of a relation in it, and more will, be, will appear in the paper. 
Okay, what does this have to do with Kumano homology? Well, this is linked up by a theorem of Griggs, Bilicata, and Verli from 2015. So they proved that, I guess, yeah, so I paraphrase the result, but effectively they prove if you give me a framed oriented knot K and also a base point on it, then this determines a functor from dotted temporal leap into bigraded vector spaces over Q, which does the following. So the object N, N boundary points in temporal leap, gets sent to the Havana homology of the N-fold parallel cable of the knot, where the parallelism is determined by the framing. Now, um, you can ask what do cups and caps go to? Well, they go to cobordism maps in Kavana homology induced from annular, co uh, annular cobordisms. And then because this is Karubi complete, we can also um, lift this functor to Karubi completion of DTL, and we can ask what does a Jones-Wenzel projector go to? Well, it goes to Kovanov's categorification of the n colored Jones polynomial, since we work over Q. And now, here's our definition of the Kirby colored Kovanov homology. We can also evaluate this functor on an object in the int completion because the target category has filtered co-limits. And we define the Kirby colored Kovanov homology of a knot to be what you get as the evaluation of this functor. So, down to earth, what this means is you first compute the, color, the Kavana homologies of all cables of the knot, you symmetrize, and then you form a co-limit over induced by dotted annulus maps between these Kavana homologies. And there's a similar definition for links. So for each component of a link, you can decide whether to leave it alone or to color it with a Kirby color. Then you can decide which Kirby color to color it with. And then there's a corresponding colored Kavana homology of that, date, of that link with additional data. Easy example here. If we take the unknot, Kirby color it with Kirby color K, we exactly get um, the fiber functor from DTL to graded vector spaces evaluated at the Kirby K. And that's the Verma module of highest weight zero. And so the graded dimension of this is given by the geometric series again. So it's something in principle computable. Okay, um, what, what, does that, does it, what does this have to do with um, four-dimensional scan modules? Well, here's a theorem, and this is somehow historically in completely the wrong order, but, 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 but this is it. Okay, so we take a framed link in the three-sphere, and we write it as a union of two links, L and L prime. L prime I'm going to leave alone, but L I will Kirby color, and then I'll compute the command of homology of this. It turns out that what you get depends up to isomorphism only on the four manifold that is obtained from the four ball by attaching two handles along L, so the, this part of the, of the link, and the rest of the link. So this L prime will survive and give us a link in the boundary of that four manifold. Okay, and then there's something great out here because I was a bit imprecise here. You have to choose a version of the Kirby color to put on the components, and this will determine some relative second homology class with ZMO2 coefficients for the four manifold, and, and this is also something we have to keep track of. So what's the history of this theorem? So in this paper that we're preparing currently with Matt Hogenkamp and David Rose, um, we define this Kirby color Kovanov homology, and then we prove that it coincides with something that was studied by Manolesco and Nathalov two years ago, and then in this other paper with Manolesco and Walker from a few weeks ago, that is called cable Kavanaugh homology. You don't, know, you don't need to know what this is, um, but, um, but it's the same as this Kirby color Kavanaugh homology. And then where does this come from? Well, so it seems, if I, if I show you this theorem, and, and somehow my first inclination to proving such a theorem would be to prove some invariance on the Kirby moves and, and so on. Um, but it, it's actually much more convenient to prove such a theorem by relating it to a four-manifold invariant that is somehow manifestly a four-manifold invariant where I don't have to check certain moves or so on. And luckily, there is such an intrinsic, uh, somehow manifestly four-dimensional invariant. And it is, it is really a four-dimensional skin module built from link homology. And that's what you find in this paper by uh, Scott Morris and Kevin Walker and myself from three years ago. So, so, so that's basically why it's an invariant. Kirby colored Kavanaugh homology is the same thing as cable Kavanaugh homology. It's the same thing as a four-dimensional skein module for a two-handle body. So that brings me to the second, the third part of the talk, uh, where I'll say a little bit more about how these skein modules are constructed. 
Okay, so what's the input? I, I'm gonna work in a slightly more general setting, um, not just Havana homology, but the GLN link homologies. That's somehow the natural setting in which this currently works. Um, so what are they? They're associated to GLN, so there's a parameter N. And, and I, can, I can black box what they are by telling you that these are lax symmetric monoidal functors from a category of framed oriented links in the three sphere or the morphisms are link cobordisms in three sphere times interval up to isotopy rel boundary with values so that the, the, the target of the functor is just a category of bi-graded abelian groups. And you have two gradings. One is the Q grading and one is the homological grading. So originally these invariants were defined by Kavanov and Rosansky in 2004 and then this result here uses a, con a combinatorial construction which builds on work of Robert and Wagner and the functionality statements uh, were proved in papers with Michael Erik and Daniel Tubenhauer in the case of R3 and in this paper with Scott Morrison, Kevin Walker in the case of the three sphere. And if you're only interested in the case n equals two, what this thing, um, what this thing is, it's, it's exactly Christian Blanchet's oriented model for Kavana homology, which you can find um, in his 2010 archive paper. And now the idea for the construction of the skein modules is fairly similar to the construction of skein modules in three dimensions. Um, we want our skeins will be surfaces embedded in the four manifold and we impose some, we take linear combinations of those and then we impose local skein relations. Local in this case means localized in four balls. And what we want to impose are relations that we see in the kernel of the link homology functor. So here's a description of what the skeins will look like. We call them lasagna fillings because there's a two-dimensional lasagna, fill, lasagna sheet that fills, um, that fills the four manifold. I had some complaints from Italians. They told me this should actually be called a cannelloni filling. The, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll object to that a little bit later. Um, okay, so what is this about? So we take a four manifold, we take a link in the boundary, and then, so here's a drawing of, a sketch drawing of a piece of four manifold, which has this red link here in the boundary. So this, this is another boundary link. Um, and then the lasagna filling, you should think about as a four dimensional analog of a ribbon graph in a three manifold. So there, there's the string. The string gets replaced by the lasagna sheet sigma. This is the surface. And then there are the boundary points. Um, so these are boundary points get replaced by boundary links. And then there are coupons. So we need some model for coupons. And the coupons we get by drilling out four dimensional balls from a four manifold. And then you ask, okay, so the sheet has to interact with these coupons. And it interacts in links that live in the boundary of these four balls that we've drilled out. And then we also need labels on the coupons. And the labels here are link homology classes of the links in these three spheres. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the analogy that I want to make. So these things will span the skein. Uh, then we also need skein relations, and the skein relations should somehow be the kernel of the link homology functor. And now here's a very similar picture. So this is the four ball, and now we can consider something like a lasagna filling for the four ball, except that we don't have any labels on the coupons. And then these types of diagrams, so we have a link on the outside, links on the insides in these input spheres, and then we have some lasagna sheet that join them. This forms an operat. And if you have a, a big, a big, we have a, two of these things, and the output here matches the input of the other one, you can shrink the one, glue it into, the, into, this, into an input of the second one, and you get a diagram of a similar type. And then we have to prove something technical about these link homologies, namely that they are algebras for this type of operat. So we call this the lasagna operat, and we call the algebra for the lasagna operat uh, lasagna algebra. Okay, so there's some, some technical thing going on. And now here's the definition of the skein module. So we take linear combinations of lasagna fillings in the four manifold with the prescribed boundary link and then we impose some relations on this. And the relations are generated by isotopy of lasagna fillings and local skein relations. And the skein relation goes like this. If you have a diagram, like here, you can identify it with a diagram where you drill out a larger four ball. Um, this will create, in a generic situation, a new boundary link that I've drawn here. 
And now you, this is somehow some bigger coupon, but now you need, to, need a label for that coupon. And how do we get it? Well, you take the labels that appeared in the input balls for what you've drilled out, and then the rest of the stuff you've drilled out gives you a map from this uh, lasagna algebra structure, and you can feed in these, these labels into the map, you get some other vector out, and this is the label that you put here. Well, that's one way of, 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 of modeling how these coupons can be collapsed, several coupons can be collapsed into a bigger coupon if you want. So that's the definition. Let's observe some things. So this is um, a bi-grade, uh, it starts as a bi-grade abelian group. We still have this Q grading and we still have this homological grading. But then there's actually an additional grading, namely by the relative second homology of the four manifold. Oops. Um, and this comes simply from the fact that every piece of lasagna represents such a homology class and all the relations we impose are homogeneous. Okay, so this naturally breaks along second homology classes. Some basic observations. So if we start with the four ball, this thing is constructed in a way that if you give me the four ball and the link in the boundary, I will recover the link homology. And this is somehow, this is somehow the, the paradigm that this construction is following. So the link homology is maybe not an invariant of a link in, in the three manifold S3. It's maybe actually an invariant of the four manifold with the link giving you a boundary condition. Okay, so it's somehow taking a bulk perspective. Okay, and then there are a few more basic observations that one can make. Say, for simplicity, let's work over a field. Then we have an assignment of four manifold and link in the boundary to the corresponding skein module defined over a field. And this is monoidal under disjoint union of four manifolds, connect sum of four manifolds, and boundary connect sum of four manifolds. So this looks already very much like a TQFT kind of thing. Um, and now we want to be able to compute these. And as any kind of skein theory, this is really, this assignment of four manifold and link to the skein module is, is, is very compatible with gluing operations. It's more like a language problem to explain what these gluing operations are. Um, and using this, this, this naturality and functionality under gluing operations, what we would really like to understand is how this invariant changes if we add handles to our four manifold, or rather actually what happens if we detach handles from our four manifold. Well, and exactly that's the, that's the last part of the talk. So that's the summary, um, the summary theorem for the work that appeared in this recent paper with Manolescu and Walker, and which heavily builds on a previous paper by Cipri and Manolescu and his former student, Ikshu Nathala, from two years ago. So the, the end result can be summarized saying that these skein modules for a given four manifold and link in the boundary can be computed as a quotient of a countable direct sum of link homologies of links in the three sphere, modulo certain relations, or modulo certain, uh, certain identifications that are expressed explicitly in terms of cobordism maps in the link homology. Okay, and the recipe for doing this really comes from a handle decomposition. So the idea is you present, you give, you, you, you give a handle decomposition of the four manifold and then you want to compute the skein module for this and you start to detach four handles, three handles, two handles, one handles and in the end you have something expressed in terms of zero handles whereby the example that I had before, we know how to compute this, it's just given by link homologies in the three sphere. Okay, I wanna say a little bit more about his, how about this recipe works. So here, uh, let's recall what handles are. So handles are the analog um, of a cell decomposition of a topological space, but it's the manifoldy version. So a K handle is um, a K dimensional disk, a ball thickened up to dimension four by another ball and then here's some, some language that I want to use inside such a, so eventually this is a four dimensional ball but presented as a particular product. Inside there, you have a K dimensional ball called the core. This is kind of the, the disc that you want to attach if you want to do a cell decomposition. Um, this is attached along its boundary which is called the attaching sphere. 
And then there's a complementary uh, ball called the co-core. So this, is, um, this intersects the core in exactly one point. And the relevance of the co-core is, is that if, once you've done a handle attachment, you can undo it by drilling out the co-core. Okay? That's what we're gonna use. Okay, and now here's the general strategy for, for understanding how the skein modules behave under detaching a handle. So let's suppose we are interested in the skein module of W prime with a link L prime in the boundary. And let's suppose the W prime results from the four manifold, oops, this is somehow. Okay, so let's suppose the W prime results from a four manifold W by attaching a single handle, okay? So now there's a three-step process to figure out what we're gonna to have to do. So first, we, we recall that the skein module of W prime is spanned by lasagna fillings in W prime with boundary given by the link L prime. So here is maybe the most complicated situation that arises in practice. It's the case of a one handle. For a one handle, it can happen that you have part of your link L prime running across it, okay? And what we want, what we want to do is we want to cut the co-core of that handle and relate it to the lasagna filling of the previous manifold, which we maybe already understand because it has fewer handles and we do induction in the number of handles. Okay, so let's say we have a lasagna filling in you know, somehow of this one handle with this link that runs across the one handle. Now if I cut it, here actually you see the corners of the lasagna sheet. Yeah, it's not cannelloni, it's lasagna, it has corners. Um, but so if you cut here and the lasagna filling is somehow in generic position, the lasagna sheet will intersect the co-core of this, of this one handle in a tangle. So we have, to, we have to glue these tangles in here. And if you, 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 if you have different lasagna, you might actually see different handles here. It's very different, different tangles here. And they complete what remains of the link L prime after cutting to a family of possibly different links L gamma. Okay, so this operation, this somehow topological uh, way of cutting skeins is designed to tell us which kind of links in the previous four manifold are relevant for presenting lasagna upon attaching the, the handle. Okay, so that's somehow the preparatory statement. This operation of cutting is not an operation of skein modules, okay? So this is, this is just somehow giving us some intuition for what links become relevant after cutting. What is actually a map on skein modules comes in step two. So this is where we actually take the family of lasagna fillings for the right-hand picture, and we map it to lasagna filling on the left by gluing. And that's the functorial operation on these skein modules. That's something we can do. So we get, we induce maps from the skein modules of the easier four manifold with family of links in the boundary to the more complicated four manifold with our given link in the boundary. And we find as many of these maps as necessary so that, oops, no. So that once we go from the direct sum of all of these skeins into the skein we're interested in, we get a surjection. Okay, and we find, we find that this is a surjection because here we started to cut all possible lasagna fillings and once we can somehow re-glue, we can create all of these lasagna fillings by re-gluing, we know that this is a surjection. Okay, and once you have a surjection, you're left studying the kernel. And once we can get an explicit description of the kernel, we can describe this skein module here as a quotient of the direct sum of these skein modules and that's it. That's, that's kind of the general strategy. So three steps, topological lasagna cutting to find out which links are relevant, get inducing maps from gluing, summing them up, and computing the kernel. So it's countable. Yeah, it's all over all, exactly. And it depends on the, hand, on the type of the handle. It depends on the index of the handle what you get. The easiest case is the four-handle. So um, a four ha if we have a four-handle attachment, um, it turns out that we don't have to change the link at all. We don't even have to change the lasagna at all. We simply, get an, we simply look at the inclusion of old four-manifold paired with link into new four-manifold paired with eventually the same link and then this actually turns into an isomorphism. So the special case that happens here is that 
cutting doesn't give us any new interesting links. In the second step, we just have the standard embedding and we don't need to take a direct sum over many things, we just get one, and there's no kernel. Okay? And that's something that is probably reminiscent for people who studied three-dimensional skein modules. If you add a three-handle, if you just fill a, a, a point to your space that was missing, then, then that's an isomorphism. So same thing happens here. Okay, so in the, in the recent paper, we have a, a, a basically a description of what happens under all handles of index um, from zero to four. And this would be a bit too much to do in this talk to explain explicitly, um, but I want to pick out one particular case, and that is the case of two handles, and for simplicity, I will reduce to n equals two. So let's run through this algorithm, this general strategy from the previous slide. Uh, the first thing we have to do is we have to take a lasagna filling of the manifold with the two handle attached. And we assume that this lasagna filling is in generic position. So it, um, it intersects the co-core of the two handle transversely. The lasagna is two dimensional. The co-core is two dimensional. So uh, generically, these will intersect in oriented points. Okay? So if we cut the co-core of this two handle, I always imagine this is somehow popping a balloon. Okay, so, so if the lasagna sheet is a balloon, you drill out the cocoa that pops the balloon, and then ask, okay, so what, what happens to the, to the lasagna filling when you pop this balloon? And it turns out where you put the needle in, you actually create a new boundary component. You create a new boundary circle in your lasagna. And now, if you, well, if you do this in, in general, if you cut the cocoa, you get from the lasagna filling F prime of the bigger manifold, you get a new lasagna filling of the old manifold, the li you, you still have some link, uh, some, some version of L prime surviving to the other four manifold L, but then you get additional boundary components. And what are they? They are parallel cables of the attaching link, of the, of the attaching knot of the two handle. And the number of strands in that cable is just the number of intersection points of the co-core with the lasagna filling. Okay, so you pop, um, a certain number of concentric balloons, and then you get the cable of the attaching, attaching knot. Okay, so step two, we re-glue these things. So what, ha what means re-gluing? Well, you want to attach the two handle, and you want to attach the two handle along this attaching knot, and you have to deal with the fact that actually you, you had a link in the boundary there. So what you need to do is you cap this link off with core parallel disks in the two handle. Okay. That um, gives us a map, and then we sum all these maps. So here again, we have a countable sum, like Anna asked about, um, from the skein of the old four manifold with the old link, and here is a k-fold cable of the attaching knot, and we subject onto the skein module of the manifold with the two handle attached. And then we, we, we need to study the kernel of this operation, and I won't prove to you that these are the relations, but I'll tell you the relations, and I'll tell you why they're plausible. So three types of relations. Between these skein modules, there are natural maps given by annuli that create two additional strands in the cable. You can, there's a flavor of this map where you put dots on the annulus, and if you put a dot on the annulus, then one relation in the quotient here says that you should identify vectors um, in these skein modules under their images so with their images under dotted annulus maps. And the reason is this. If you have a dotted annulus map near the attaching region, and then you cap it off with core parallel disks, from the perspective of the interior of the two handle, you just see a dotted sphere. And one of the skein relations that I showed you on the third slide or so, was that a dotted sphere evaluates to one. Okay, so that's, that's why we need to identify these vectors. Second relation, images of undotted annulus maps should be set to zero in the quotient. And the reason is simply, if you have an annulus next to this attaching region and you cap it off with core parallel disks, from the perspective of the two handle, you see a sphere without dots and that's set, going to be set to zero. Okay? And then there's a final relation that says that braiding parallel strands of the attaching knot, of the, of the cable of the attaching knot, um, should act as the identity. And the reason for that is that if you have core parallel disks in the two handle, then they braid around each other, right? So they, they're modeled on um, point in the disk times disk, and the points braid in the disk 
So the disks braid in the, in the two handles. And so we need to make these identifications. Okay, and now I can, I, can, I can make plausible for why this curvy color that we defined in dotted temporary lib is the right thing. Because it exactly corresponds to these relations in this game. So we think of the two handle as something that gets attached near the framed knot K. And the, the category that governs what happens near this attaching region is the annular baratan category incarnated here as dotted temporary leap. Now the two handle should be some kind of a module for this uh, attaching region. So that the, the attaching region gives you some kind of an algebra object and this gain module as well as the two handle give you modules and then you perform some relative tensor product. So I want, I'm interested in the module given by the two handle and now we go through these relations in reverse. The first thing you want to know is that braiding strands in the cable is supposed to give us, uh, supposed to give us the identity. So my two handle object needs to satisfy the, the property that if I do crossings before it, um, I, can, I can absorb them into this module. And now there's a, there's a candidate that I know in dotted temple leap which does the thing, and this is just putting two Jones Wenzels next to each other. Okay, so here I have to, I, I, I treat them separately because. Yes? So if you have a knot, how is the way to make the angular knot the way by choosing four square plates? So how, how do you decide whether to perform the angular knot? So, uh, yes, so, so Anna asks um, how, I, how I interpret an, a given knot as an annular knot. And so I only want to do this for, for, for attaching knots for two handles. And attaching knots for two handles are framed, and that tells me what my annulus is. The fra a framed knot is a band, it's an annulus, yeah. All right, so, uh, so here I have to be a bit careful with orientations here, so I put two jones wenzel projectors next to each other. Second relation, images of dotted annulus maps are zero. In the language of dotted temporal leap, a dotted annulus is a cup, so I want something that kills cups, this thing almost does the job, except not in the middle, so I upgrade my candidate to the entire jones wenzel projector. Okay, uh, final relation, we need to ensure that dotted annulus maps act as SD identity. Now that's something I cannot do in, with just, just jones wenzel projectors. But a good replace, so this is, the th this is the kind of relation that an infinite jones wenzel projector would satisfy, but we don't have this, so we replace it by this directed system. So that's, um, that's kind of where these relations come from. All right, so I want to finish with some computations. Um, the, first the first one was, is a computation due to Manolesco and Nathalov, the scale module of S2 times D2 with empty link and the boundary. Um, so uh, turns out that this, is an, that this is a ring. It's a ring because we have, it's a commutative ring because we have this D2 factor here. And it is isomorphic to this, um, to this polynomial ring, um, so one variable is invertible. The degrees of this generators range between zero and two n minus two, I think. And you can, there's, there's a sensible way in thinking about this as the representation ring of GLN. Okay, so that's some, something that shows up naturally. I guess in the case of n equals two, we've already seen this computation because we would compute this as the Kirby colored unknot. Okay, so for n equals two, this is this Verma module. Right, um, a slightly less trivial computation also by Manolesco and Nathalov is for CP2 and CP2 bar. So these are one framed and minus one framed unknots. So they are already, so we don't have complete computations for them. If we wanted to compute them, we would first have to compute torus link homologies. So for, t, for k comma k or k comma minus k torus links in Kovanov homology or kovanov rosansky homology and then we would have to sum them and take a quotient described in terms of images of dotted annulus maps between them. So that's, that's a pretty hard computation, um, but it's somehow connected to, uh, to, to previous research because homologies of torus links are a very well studied um, subject. And, and the partial computations that exist for them um, led Manolesco and Nathalov to, to compute these scale modules for n equals two in certain degrees, and this was enough to check that these scale modules are non-isomorphic, which tells us that this invariant is at least sensitive to orientation. 
Okay, and then in the, in the recent paper, we looked at the case of one handles, and one handles are a bit less well behaved. And so if we consider B3 times S1 with two endpoints in the boundary, uh, two endpoints times S1 in the boundary, so to parallel, in some case, an, an essential unlink, then these gain modules can be infinite, run, infinite rank in certain degrees if n is greater or equal to two. Now this might be a good, this might be good news or bad news, and I'm, I'm, I'm not settled on this yet. So the bad news is that this doesn't have a, a dimension anymore, it doesn't have a greater dimension anymore. On the other hand, it's something, it also tells us that it's not really a categorification of something anymore, it's something new, right? So somehow this tells us that, or somehow intuition we might have for some um, invariance one dimension down will fail when we think about these. Okay, um, I'll finish with some open questions. So we don't know whether these invariants detect exotic smooth structures. We don't know when they are finitely generated of finite rank. Um, there's some, some, some guesses. So for example, what happens if, if we have, um, if you have a simply connected four manifold, is it finitely generated? We don't know. Is it finitely generated for all two handle bodies? We don't know. Um, but what really seems to be um, essential to compute more of this are effective methods for computing link homologies in families and colored link homologies in families. So if you're working on this, um, I'll, I'll invite you to also think about these scale modules. We could use a lot of help computing them. In families, so I want to uh, want to compute. So Dora asks, what means computing in families? So, for example, the family of covalent homologies for k comma k torus links. Yeah, or, or something like that. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, questions, please. Thank you, Paul. Very interesting talk. So, uh, can you compute, say, just hope link with two Kirby colors on it? Not yet. So not, not yet. Um, this, is, this is one of the most interesting computations, yes. Um, um, I've been thinking about this, and I cannot compute it yet. OK, so, so and it's definitely so. There is any sense, probably, yeah, to, to put root of unity for your uh, parameter? That, that's, that's a wonderful question, okay. and I don't know okay. anything about okay. it. I still don't understand how you did, why the sum over on the page 30 in your slide, why the sum is uh, even computable. So, I mean, uh, yeah. it, it, okay, so let's, let me go back. 13, you say? 13, yeah. 13 or 13? No, 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 13. 3-0. 3-0. So, for oh. me, it looks like sum over all gammas. Yes, which exactly. Are all, uh, not yes, so links? So, no, yeah, this is, this is a sum of all, all tangles with a given number of endpoints, yeah. And you can reduce to somehow representative sub to isotopy. But yes, this is a countable sum. But it's, al it's already a countable sum for the two handle formula, right? It's just, it looks like a, an easier countable sum here. So you, you can count uh, all tangles with given number of endpoints? Yeah, so this means up to you, isotopy, you, yes. You can count just all links more data. Yeah. It's not easy to compute, but at least we have a recipe. More questions? So it seems that uh, it's uh, Kirby color, it corresponds to a Verma uh, with a zero highest weight. So can you get something for uh, Verma with uh, other weight, uh, highest weights? Yes, integral weights we can get. I can, uh, uh, let me find the definition of the Kirby. So I suppress the grading shifts. I suppress the grading shifts here. Um, so we put the Kth Jones Wenzel in Q degree minus K. Which Kth Jones Wenzel corresponds to the irreducible of dimension K plus one. If I look at the graded dimension of this or of the character of this, I shift it down by Q to the K, I get the highest weight vector in degree zero. Right? But I could simply use a, I don't know, shift, do a global shift, global Q shift of this, and that would give me a Verma in a different highest weight. Or, I mean, it's not really a Verma, it's just, it looks like a Verma. Integer. Integer weight, yes. That's right. 
If there are no more questions, I suggest to thank Paul once more for his nice talk.